We're out in the woods early this morning because we wanted to get here literally before the birds got up. That, I found out, is how you catch one. Hi, I'm Chris Temke. Welcome to Exploring Florida. Well, today we're a little south and east of Naples in the Big Cypress National Preserve. It's a wilderness area bigger than the state of Delaware. It's also an area of subtle beauty and one of my favorite places. My guest today is Deborah Jansen. She's the preserve's wildlife biologist. We're going to begin by capturing an endangered species, the red cockaded woodpecker. It's part of one of the ongoing research projects here at Big Cypress. I'm going to go find Deb and see if I can't give her a hand. Stay with me. May comes. I'm going to try to keep it on the tree. Good idea. Good idea. He seems like he's snake, but that's a good idea. Oh, careful. There's a, see, there's a gap. On the, on the right? No, right in the center. She's, okay. she's working her way toward it. Got her. This was what I was afraid of. Yeah. <sighs> What's a male? <laughs> I thought, when I looked at her the other day, I thought I saw red, but you know, I thought There's it was... Over here yeah, right? yeah. This is good. Here he is. Great. That's a young male. Hi, Deb. How Hi, you doing? Chris. I'd like you, you to meet Ken Meyer. Hi, Ken. Nice Ken's to meet you. Ken's been working with me on woodpecker work here in Big Cypress. And I guess you got one, huh? We got one. Yeah. What do we got? Well, we thought we were going to get the adult female, but it's a male. So it's one of the juvenile or helper males. Now, the red cockaded is, is an endangered species or just threatened right now? It's endangered species. It mm -hmm. In Florida, right? Um, it's federally endangered. Oh, federally. Mm -hmm. okay. What's the range of this bird then? Is it, is it just, I'm not real familiar with it, I guess. It's through a number of the southeastern states and extends over as far into Texas. Hmm. Not very big either. Okay, now what are you going to be doing here? So you can see that it's a male. By there's the red cockade. That's what it got its name. Oh, yeah. yeah. How it got its name. Up. Okay. Are and you going to ban this bird? Right. We're going to ban it and take measurements on it. Okay. Well, you can just. Let me get a good grip. Yeah. We don't want to lose them. There. You can see the the red cockade mm -hmm. right above the eye. Yeah. Now is that the red spot is only on the males, not the females? That's right. Mm -hmm. And, and the young males have a red crown, and then that disappears, and then these feathers develop red. Okay. The females have no red on them. So this one is somewhere between an adult and a really young one, I guess. This would huh? be considered uh, an, uh, probably an adult. It probably was our, a young one from the nest last year. Hmm. Okay. Well, what do you got to do? Okay. Want to band first? Yeah, we'll band it first just in case it does get away. Then we'll have the bands on it. We have a, a federal aluminum band on with a, with a number, and then we have a, a series of colored combinations that we put on the bird so that we can identify the individuals from a distance. Okay. This is the colored combination here. It's going to get. That's right. What's the combination? Okay. Dark blue over aluminum. Right. Left left leg will be dark blue over aluminum, which is the federal band, and right leg will be green over light blue. 
Okay. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the habitat of this bird while you putting it on there. He lives in these pine trees, I, I know that. Right, they're unique in that they need uh, living pines. Living pines. And they use the old growth pines that are beginning to develop uh, a heart rot in them and therefore make their cavity excavation a lot easier. And uh, that uniqueness has caused problems because typically um, after the old growth forests were logged, timber practices usually have a shorter rotation. So a lot of pines don't get old enough to be suitable for the woodpecker again, and that's why they're listed as endangered, mm. because uh, that habitat is being, has been and has continued to be lost. And this is part of a multi-year study, I guess, right, that Ken's been doing? That's right. We started last year doing some banding in Big Cypress so we would get a better idea of the uh, movement and dispersal of the birds in the area. Mm -hmm. We can number back. If you All right. Want. Aluminum band is five, three, six, five, zero. Okay. Record there, the well, the age would just sex. be yeah, a mm -hmm. juvenile or adult, mm -hmm. and the sex is a male. Okay, wing. Yeah, uh, right wing if you can. All right. You've got a pretty wing. Now these tree, uh, these birds eat what primarily insects in the trees then. Mm-hmm. They'll um, forage both on the bowl of the tree and also up in the canopy and get mainly insects. Yeah, you gotta, you got to look up to find these birds. Their holes are pretty high up in the tree, aren't they, usually? What we, what we have found here is that the mature trees are about um, 20 meters in height and the average of the cavity is about half of that. Yeah, right. So the cavities are usually just under the canopy itself. Hmm. We got that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Bill? But we're doing the distal edge of the nearest to the tip, is that right? Yeah, we were doing, trying, we'll looking both. at both of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Will you try to recapture these birds periodically and, and collect more information on them, or will they just be observed? We'll probably just observe these birds to, for bands from now on. And um, the, the young birds that we band are especially important because the young females will disperse in an attempt to find a, a lone male in another area and, and therefore set up a new cluster of trees. And so it's important for us to see where the young birds disperse to and it would also tell us how successful they are in starting up new clusters. Mm -hmm. is, is there enough habitat left in the Big Cypress? How, how threatened is the habitat now here in, in this area? Are the nesting potential sites, potential nesting sites, pretty limited in the Big Cypress? In Big Cypress we know of uh, 37 colonies and seven of those right now are inactive. There's a couple, I'm not sure of their status. It may be that uh, I don't, maybe the birds moved like over into the next pineland and I haven't found the, the mm. new trees yet. But we have probably about 30 active colonies. Mm. and. Um, if they can hang on in the pines, the old growth pines that are here now, for probably about another 20 years, the second growth pines from the earlier logging will then be mature. So hmm. potentially in Big Cypress, we do have enough habitat to support a population. Hmm. So now do they call and, and like drum on trees like the other woodpeckers I know to, to mark off a territory? And sometimes uh, for alarm, they'll call if they're upset or something, they'll sometimes also mm -hmm. give, a, give, give a, a call out. Um, oftentimes how they forage is just by flecking the bark off of the bowl of the tree. And, and you can, that will tell you, sometimes that's an indication that there are woodpeckers in an area because they'll fleck off the old bark and then you'll see reddish bark underneath the, the, the old stuff is off so you see the newer redder bark and that gives you an indication that you might have red cockades in the area. Is that what I'm seeing in this one pine tree right here or is that 
I see some reddish areas. That's some of it. Uh huh. Some, of it. some trees, especially their cavity trees that they fleck off a lot, are, are literally smooth. And they also, on their cavity trees, um, drill small what we call resin wells, and that stimulates the the pine to the resin to come down the sap, so to speak. And the theory is that they do that because it keeps uh, snakes, arboreal snakes, from coming up the tree and getting into their uh, huh. nest and taking either the young or the eggs. Mm -hmm. And they've done some experiments on that even and have shown that some of the, the those snakes can't come up over the resin or don't go up over the resin. Why don't we let this guy go here and let him get about his business if he's ready. I think he looks okay. Mm -hmm. I think he's probably had enough of us <laughs> talking and looking at him. And catch up with his family and uh, uh, tell him. <laughs> funny thing happened on the way out of the, the cavity this morning. <laughs> okay, if you want to take the head. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Would you like to release it? Sure. Okay. That'd be fun. What are we going to do here? Well, what he'll probably do is uh, sit on your hand for just a second. Okay. So. If, um, okay. You want me to hold him? Or? Yeah, hold him or, or just hold his, his legs first between your fingers, both of his legs, and then I'll back off, and then Let when you think... Let me hold it. Okay, just hold this there, and then just sort of open up okay. your hand, and you don't have to throw him up or anything, all just right. he'll, he'll go off on his own. Okay. We always do a double check. We have all the data, right? Yep. Okay, we're set then. Okay. All right, well, we'll let you go back. Anytime. This is uh, one of the woodpecker colonies that, as you can see, was really devastated by the hurricane. That's what's left of a woodpecker colony. That's right. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about Big Cypress. How long has this place been around? It was established in 1974, and at that time, a uh, hundred, or excuse me, 575,000 acres were set aside, and in 1988, an additional 146,000 were added on, uh, particularly up in the northeast part of the of the preserve. So we're talking like 700,000 acres mm -hmm. of uh, land. That, that's a huge area. Now, it's called a national preserve, but I notice you're working for the National Park Service. Uh, why is that? Well, this is the first preserve within the national park system. And the reason it was given the name preserve is because it uh, was protecting a particular value or quality. And in the case of Big Cypress, it's the water flow and the associated ecosystem. Hmm. And uh, you've been here for how many years now? I've been here for 12 years. Uh, we have a lot of traditional uses out here. That's another reason it's, it's called a preserve versus a park. Uh, we have hunting out here. We have off-road vehicle use, we have oil and gas development, and these things were uh, promised when the preserve was established that they would continue on. So that's why it can't be a national park, because some of those uses are not compatible with a national park, are they? That's right. Like oil drilling and hunting, I'm exactly. sure. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what kind of activities go on out here at Big Cypress? Well, we have hunting, which at this point is the main visitor activity off, off the, the, the paved roads. Uh, we also have the Florida Trail that's being used, and uh, we have the oil and gas. We have some limited cattle grazing that is continuing in the preserve. Yeah, I noticed when we flew in here in the helicopter, I could see the, the off-road vehicle tracks. They, they show up rather prominently. I guess uh, there's some research that's being done on those, isn't there, to see what their impact is on the area? That's right. It's, our mandate is to preserve the natural resources of the area but at the same time provide for traditional uses of the area. And sometimes that's really in conflict and we have to make some real hard decisions uh, because obviously there is an impact of the off-road vehicles, yet that is a use of the area that will continue. So this area really was, was just devastated by this storm. What happened to the woodpeckers that were here? Well, over here, the tree that you can see that is snapped up there was one of the active roost trees and that now isn't being used by the birds because there's just it's not live anymore. And then the other one, which was the male's roost and the nest tree last year, 
is this big uprooted one right here. Hmm. The soil is so thin down here and the water, water was high at the time of the hurricane, so a lot of the trees just came up at the roots. Yeah, they didn't even snap off, did they? I was here right after the hurricane and assessing the situation and what we did in this situation was um, cut, I don't think we can move it, it looks pretty heavy, nice. there we go. Oh, okay. But what we did was cut out the cavity to take a look at it. Oh. So this was the, the nest tree hmm. last year and the cavity itself probably goes down to about here. It doesn't go up, huh? No, it really doesn't go up, hmm. they just work going down. And here, this will give you a good example of, of the heart rot. And the birds look at these old growth pines and the ones that are beginning to get this heart rot in them because when they start excavating into this heartwood, it's a lot easier for them to make a cavity when they can, in something as brittle as this. Yeah, really. So this seems to be a requirement for the birds. Well, they must be able to tell somehow then, right? That this, that the tree they're, they're hitting on is uh, got a hollow, it must be some resonating sound or something they pick up in their bills. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, I suspect you're right on yeah. that. They must be able to tell. And what's the prognosis for this area? I'd say not very good just looking around. Well, we knew there was a male and a female and at least one nestling in this prior to the hurricane. And afterwards, in, the, in surveying it and using a tape call, we only found the male so far. So our goal is to come back here and not only see what birds survived the hurricane, but also see if the habitat can support any woodpeckers down here anymore. Might you have to catch that one and, and move them to possibly, someplace where there's a habitat for them? Possibly do that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, what are we going to do next? Well, I want to show you another area of hurricane damage, and that's the tree islands. Uh, they're over a little bit to the east, and we're going to meet up with Steve Sparks, who's studying the tree snail, another species that really was affected by the hurricane. Oh, okay, well, let's go do that. Okay. Well, here we are, huh? This is uh, part of the Hess group of hammocks out here. These are called either hammocks or tree islands. I noticed on the way out, though, Deb, a lot of them are just really kind of trashed, aren't they? Uh, to an untrained eye, it might look okay because the, the trees are green. There's, there's leaves on there. Yeah, but there's a lot but, of things that are blowing down. Right. And obviously, something happened out right, there. Right, right. Um, Prior to the hurricane, which happened on August 24th, if you would look at this hammock, it would be just a, a solid green mass, and you would not see inside that hammock at all. All you would see is the vegetation at the edge. But now you can see they're all blown open, and you see even the trees right in the middle of the area. Let's go and take a look. OK. Things are a little dense in here right now, with all the dead uh, down wood and everything. It's really different. If you would have come in here with me prior to the hurricane, we wouldn't be seeing any sky or any sunlight right now because the overstory trees would have completely covered it and the understory would have been a lot more open than this. Hmm. Uh, well, I noticed the trees are coming back though. I mean, they're making a, a comeback here, aren't they? Some of them are coming back. Uh, I think time will tell whether or not they're going to live though. Some of them might just be reacting to the stress of the event. Were they pretty much the ones that survived? Was, was the vegetation pretty much blown off of them? Uh, that and also just uh, branches themselves were just snapped off of them. But because the trunk remained on some of them, those are the ones that survived. Hmm. Some of them, as you can see, the oak over there is completely uprooted. Yeah, yeah, it did. Uh, looks like it's seen better days. Well, one of the things I picked up when I, as this as we came in, was. Uh, one of these little tree snails. I guess uh -huh. this is their habitat, huh? That's a, a ligueous tree snail. And the reason I brought you into this hammock is because we have a man who's doing research on the tree snails in this area. And yeah, I bet she's right there. <laughs> hey, Steve. How's it going? Great. Super. Okay. So what is he? What is he up to? 
Steve's uh, volunteering for the Park Service. He's been working for six years here in Big Cypress, uh, looking at the tree islands in this area to try to determine the distribution of the ligurus tree snail in the preserve. Now, is that a threatened or an endangered species of tree snails? At this point, it's listed as a species of special concern. Okay, so it's not quite up to the threatened or endangered level yet. No, it isn't. What kind of research is he doing? Right now, he's trying to assess the habitat, uh, the destruction from the hurricane to see if the tree snails are going to make it. Uh, the preferred tree of the tree snail is the Lysoloma, which is the one with the, the fine compound leaves wild there. Wild tamarind, I think. Is That's right. Wild tamarind is the common name. Yeah. So he's looking to see how many of these trees still exist in the tree islands. And then he's looking for the individual color forms. He knows uh, on most of these tree islands which ones existed before the hurricane, and he's coming back to see the impact. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't we let him uh, get back to his work, and uh, why don't we move on and uh, maybe go, uh, go look around for some of those snail kites you were telling me about before, see if we can't find some of them. All right. That's okay? fine. We're out here to look at some snail kite habitat. That's, uh, a, that's a, another, another endangered species, isn't it? Another federally endangered species, uh-huh. They, they are just using about uh, the southern part the, of Florida. That's the northern extent of their entire range. And we really didn't know very much about what they, what, if they were in Big Cypress or how much they use Big Cypress until Rob Bennett started a study a year ago. He's affiliated with the University of Florida and he has transmitters on a number of birds throughout the state and some of his birds with the transmitters moved into Big Cypress. He located them in Big Cypress and has found that it, at some times of the year with some water levels, uh, Big Cypress is important to the snail kite. In terms of what, like nesting you mean? Not nesting. He hasn't found nesting there yet, but uh, for, for foraging, for eating. Yeah, I understand. Is it true they only eat that snail called the apple snail? Is that the only thing they eat? Almost exclusively. About 99% of their diet is the apple snail, but they've also been seen to eat crayfish, uh, some crabs, and even some small turtles. I think I hear one of them calling over there. Yeah, I think it's down in the tree there, isn't it? That's right. That's a seven, eight, Just a minute. Excuse okay. me a minute. Yeah. Just... This is Jansen. Go ahead. Do you need to contact 9 Charlie Hotel in regards to a deer mortality? Copy. Jansen clear. What's that all about? Well, I'm all not right, sure. Uh, Nine Charlie Hotel is the, the name of the fixed wing aircraft that is doing some of the deer work and evidently they're, they've located a deer in mortality and we probably should go check on it if you have any time today. Yeah, well, why don't we do that? I think uh, we let the birds go back to whatever they're doing and uh, let's go see what's wrong, okay? Okay, fine. All right. I think we're getting closer. Yeah. What's the story with this dead deer that we had to go out and find? Well, uh, there's about 30 deer that still have transmitting radio collars from a study that was done from about 1990 to 1992. Uh, the Park Service funded it and the University of Florida conducted the project. They're looking at the population dynamics of the deer in relation to the Florida panther. The main prey items of the panther are the white-tailed deer and the wild hog. So they wanted to get an idea of numbers of uh, deer in the area and also the impact of hunting on that population. Yeah, and so when the plane found the signal, they called us or called you, I guess. And and now we're out here looking for it. And you, right. Has it got a, a radio collar on it or something? It has a radio collar, and the collar is made in such a way that if it does not move at all for two hours, then it goes into this fast mode, which we call mortality mode. Oh, okay. Hear it getting louder? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We, we must be almost on top yeah, of it. Yeah, we should be pretty close. Start using your eyes at this point. That's huh? right. That's right. <laughs> Wow, that's 
real loud now. I think I see the skull. That's it right up there, isn't it? Oh, you got it. Yep, yeah. right there's the skull. Okay, Deb, what do we have to do now? Well, let's see if we can see the collar and then we can turn the telemetry gear off. There it is. See up there, the yellow collar? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, yep. now let's look around and see if okay. we can figure out what happened to this animal. I'll put this aside. Okay. The skull and some of the bones. And... The deer study found that one of the major causes of mortality was uh, bobcat, believe it or not. They were even able to take adult deer, but they mostly took uh, the fawns. They had a large impact on the fawns. In fact, I think they probably had about a 50% mortality of fawns in Is the that, first year. Do you know how old this deer was? Well, uh, I don't know when it was radio collared, but we can look at the teeth and get a pretty good idea of how old it is. You can see, first of all, that it's a doe because there's no even sign that there might have been antlers oh, in there. Yeah. Even the bucks, when they've dropped their antlers, have some kind of a, a nubbin on the skull that'll show us. So we know that this is a doe. Okay. And here's some leg bones. Do you have to take these back with you? I'm going to take them back and, and turn them into the people who have conducted the study so they can look at them a little more thoroughly. Mm -hmm. well, Deb, what do you think uh, the future holds for the Big Cypress National Preserve? You've been here now for a while, I know, and uh, uh, things have changed a lot. What, what's going to happen, say, in the next five years or so? Well, we're getting a lot more visitor use than we have ever had before. We've always had the traditional use, which is the hunting. But now we're seeing more and more tourists, both from the United States and from Europe, come to see what we have to offer as far as the wildlife and the vegetation. So I anticipate that we're going to need to accommodate them to be able to show them more of the preserve than what is just along Highway 41. And we'll do that by putting in boardwalks, um, having more interpretive uh, trails for people, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to have more of an interpretive staff so that we can show these people just what the preserve has to offer. Well, I'll tell you what, we're about out of time, but uh, I want to thank you for thank you taking for the time to show to me Cypress. around. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, you got a lot of good programs going on here, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun in the future. It's a lovely area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Exploring Florida. I hope you enjoyed the show, and we'll see you again real soon. Portions of the production costs for exploring Florida have been provided by the Lely Development Corporation. Environmentally sensitive neighbors in Southwest Florida's building industry since 1964, Lely is proud to bring Exploring Florida to public television.